So here's, uh, here's Mary Meeting Bay, for those of you that don't know where it is, just north of, north of Bass. And uh, uh, Friends of Mary Meeting Bay is, is an interesting group, the only group in Maine that probably uh, does quite a mix of things. We are, do active research, uh, where we do a lot of active advocacy. We're in, uh, in, uh, in court right now in one case, but probably end up back there in another case. Uh, mostly around fish passage issues, getting fish safely past dams, hydroelectric dams in either direction. Uh, we have an active education program. We reach a couple of thousand kids each year. Uh, a few outdoor hands-on events and a lot of in-school events. And, uh, and obviously this is part of our education program. Um, and we're an, we're an active land trust. So we've protected over 1,500 acres around the bay. Um, virtually everything we do is vol with volunteers. We have one. So our speaker tonight, Larry Barnes, is a um, native of the Midcoast. I don't know if you're a native of Wiscasset or not? Yes. Oh, okay. So Wiscasset, uh, third generation realtor. I guess if you need a house, call Larry. Uh, so, uh, or if you're selling. Yeah, or if you're selling. Um, very active sportsman, uh, still on the uh, Conservation Commission? Uh, Wisconsin Conservation Wisconsin, yeah. Commission. And active uh, with the Phippsburg Sportsman's yep. Club. Uh, uh, on the board of the Phippsburg Sportsman's Association. Uh, I am the Phippsburg Sportsman's Association board member on the Phippsburg Land Trust. Uh, so those are, those are the so. three primary yeah. civic responsibilities that I have in the area. But it's all basically has come from Falconry. So that's a good segue. The Falcon is speaking up. Yep, and she will. She will absolutely speak up somewhere. So we, well, yeah, we'll get some. Hopefully, we'll get some good Falcon audio. Yeah, hopefully it won't drown out the rest of the so we, questions. We, we, and everything we, we are videotaping. Uh, we Larry will be speak probably trying to repeat some of your questions because he's wired for sound and you guys aren't. Um, we typically will run these on at least Brunswick Community Cable TV at some point. So uh, that's a good thing. Thank you all for coming and. Uh, here for Larry and uh, his friend. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it, uh, my involvement with Phippsburg really started because uh, when I, what, the river systems that I hunt are the Sprague and the Morris River. And uh, they're separated by Morris Mountain. And those two river systems are hunted extensively for ducks. So I went to the Phippsburg Sportsman Association to introduce myself and let them know what I was doing because a bird could easily, we could be hunting the Morris, bird could easily fly over the Morris Mountain, end up in the Sprague, and start diving somebody's tollers. And uh, I didn't want any accidents to happen, so I uh, introduced myself. And uh, since then, I've become very active in the Sportsman's Association. And, uh, and that's led to uh, filling their position on the uh, Phippsburg Land Trust. Now that she's had something to eat, she's going to settle right down. And uh, as I said early on, this is a, a peregrine falcon. There are 19 subspecies of peregrine falcon around the world. They're arguably probably one of the most successful birds of prey, uh, considering their range. Uh, the word peregrine is actually Latin for the wanderer. Um, although really it's only the, uh, the arctic peregrines that are truly wanderers. They're like most predators, I mean they're really only going to travel far enough to find uh, a sufficient prey base to survive through the winter. Um, and recent genome studies have also found out that true peregrines are actually close, more closely related to parrots than they are to true hawks. And if you spend time around falcons and hawks, it's pretty easy to notice the difference. Uh, and birds of prey are divided up into numerous different groups. Eagles, ospreys, we have one harrier here in the north, the northern harrier, falcons, and then the true hawks, which are broken down into two groups, which are buteos and excipiters. Um, she's, uh, you know, she is the uh, product of millions of years of evolution. She's a highly refined predator. Uh, first of all, she's very visually oriented. Her eyes are so big that she can't move her eyes in her sockets. That's why when she's bobbing her head up and down like that, she's looking at, she's judging distance here. And she's triangulating from two different reference points how far things are away from her. So that's, that's what she's doing when she's bobbing her head up and down. They also see uh, they have both monocular and binocular vision. 
Um, their best vision is through one eye uh, at about a 40 degree angle off to the side of straight down her beak. And uh, if you, uh, you might have seen a uh, public television program called Raptor Force. A friend of mine out in the Midwest actually put a, a small video camera on a peregrine and they found out that the peregrine was actually, the peregrine's dive was actually a corkscrew shape. And what she's doing is she's keeping that prey in her best line of vision all the way until she gets right up close to her prey. And then she'll switch over to binocular vision, which is what we use, two eyes fixed on one spot. And she has very, very good, very good vision. Uh, they not only see better, but they see very differently than we do. Uh, some of you might be old enough, like me, to remember when we used to go to movie theaters and movies were rolled on projectors. And when the projector slowed down, you'd start to see the frames of the film. And what that's called is flicker fusion frequency. Humans see at a speed of about 24 frames per second. It's surmised that peregrines actually see about 80 frames, 70 to 80 frames per second. So they see and perceive things very differently than we do. And that makes sense if you're a predator uh, and you're making your living at 100, 150 miles an hour, you need to interpret it, your environment much differently or much better than, than we do as people. So they see very differently than we do. <coughs> and, uh, and it's also, I've read, that uh, they take in and understand everything in their range of vision in just a fraction of a second. And that makes a lot of sense. We as humans will scan the room, look around, and then kind of make a perception or then perceive what it is we see. Uh, if you think about it, when you're living in the wild and you're always just a meal for something else, you need to be able to recognize a threat immediately. So it's easy for me to believe that that's probably, in fact, the truth, um, just to, uh, to be able to survive. You can see your feet are designed to hunt. She has long toes, long talons, and these little knobs or lobes on her feet are so when she grabs a bird, those will push down through the feathers and she can get as much surface area as possible on the bird to be able to hold on to it and keep it from flying away. So a very refined predator. She's just finishing up her molt right now. Every year she gets all new feathers. Uh, she has just a couple of primaries still to come in. Most of her train is in already. And, uh, and uh, that's what I let her do over the summer. She's just kept in high condition to be able to get a whole new set of uh, feathers. Uh, so she's in feather perfect shape in, uh, in hunting season. And we can take this wherever you want to go, uh, whether it's falconry or birds of prey, whatever you want to do. Do you mind if we take non-flash pictures? You can take pictures. She won't mind at all. Is she warning you about Ed? She seems to get very vocal when he comes up. Um, no, I mean, she can be kind of chatty. Uh, if I picked up the hood, she'd get real chatty because she, she wants to be a part of the program, and she knows that means game over. Um, but uh, no, I mean, she, she likes the spotlight. I really think, you know, she enjoys. Uh, we do a lot of these talks. I talk to schools and I talk to sportsmen's clubs. And uh, so we've been on probably 50 or 60 talks all together. And so she's really used to this environment. She's a good bird for it because she's very calm and used to people. You know, I just trapped a wild tundra peregrine a week ago. And... Uh, if I brought her into this situation, she'd just be very intimidated by being surrounded by large predators and would not be as calm as this bird is. But she's used to it. What's her life expectancy? Um, well, with a falconer, her life expectancy is a lot better than in the wild. Um, we as falconers are allowed to take immature birds because immature birds basically have an 80% mortality rate in their first year. So... The, basically, the government is saying, okay, you can go ahead and take a dead bird. As soon as she's in the possession of a falconer, though, she's guaranteed a safe environment to live in. She's guaranteed food every day. If she gets injured, she's going to get medical attention. And, uh, you know, if, if she got injured so bad where she couldn't hunt, 
I would just keep her and as long as uh, she stayed alive. So in captivity, she could live 20 years. She could hunt, you know, for 15 or 20 years. A friend of mine, that's a rouse, getting all of her feathers in order. A friend of mine hunted a goshawk for 21 years. And that goshawk ran its highest score on snowshoe hair when it was like 19 years old. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they're perfectly capable uh, to, uh, to hunt a long time. On the other hand, she can, every time the hood comes off and we go hunting, it could be the last hunt. Uh, the eagles are a big problem. She's been almost killed by an eagle at least a half a dozen times. Um, but that's just, we're hunting in the eagle's environment. Uh, we're hunting the same prey base the eagle's hunting, and it's just part of the hunt. And hopefully they smarten up to it quick uh, to be able to get out of a bad situation. And, and when I hunt, I, I scout a marsh. It's, it's very habitat specific. I'm hunting ducks in salt marsh. That's the only environment I can fly a falcon in here in Maine. It has to be big open area with prey up in that salt marsh. Um, so uh, when I go and I'm looking for a set that's going to be a good opportunity for one of my birds to, to be successful, I'm also watching the eagle activity and the other hawk activity and what's going on in the marsh then to hopefully uh, circumvent that from happening. But last year we were hunting and uh, I released her. I had a duck, I released her and uh, she start, what she does is she'll go up and take a position above me and wait for me to go in and flush the duck and then she's going to dive and try to catch the duck. Mm -hmm. She knows the routine. She's done it enough times. She knows exactly what's going on. So as soon as she's released, she immediately gets into position. And uh, I released her and I hadn't seen an eagle and when a a bird of prey is diving, it sounds like tearing canvas. It's when it's the friction ripping through their feathers at a high rate of speed. I heard this eagle and he came from behind me. He was on a downwind stoop. The wind was coming from behind me and he just missed her by maybe a foot or so. And it was an immature bald eagle. And of course, I uh, uh, pulled out the lure, started whistling to try to bring her back to me, at which she did. Um, but it was a real close call. But she also knows that safety is with me. But eagles are so attuned to benefiting from humans. Where ice fishermen go and throw unwanted fish on the ice, they hang around fishermen. So, you know, the eagle's hanging around me looking for a meal. And I've literally had an eagle just hover above me at 75 feet, not at all intimidated by me trying to bump one of my falcons off the lure that I've used to call her back with, so then it can chase and try to kill the falcon. They kill the falcon for food or because it protects their territory? Uh, both. Uh, survival strategy in the wild is to kill the competition. You know, humans have done very well at it, and uh, wild animals are no different. But it will also predate on, I mean... It's a meal. Yeah, and therefore eliminate the competition. Yeah, well, I had a beautiful uh, jerf falcon <laughs> killed by an eagle in the first winter. It was like, it wasn't even January. I got the bird in the spring, raised it up from a chick called an Ias imprint, mm -hmm. and uh, we were hunting. It chased the duck across the mouth of the moors. I couldn't get across the river, so, and a snowstorm came in, and when I fly them, they have a little transmitter attached to the tail feather. And I had a signal, but it was a broken up signal, and the juror would never come back. So what I did is I walked back to my truck, got in my truck, drove around to Morse Mountain, hiked over Morse Mountain with my transmitter in a snowstorm, got a signal and found my bird had been killed by a large uh, avian predator, probably an eagle or a large red tail, uh, and it had, it had eaten everything from the neck up. So that's typical of a bird. That's what a falcon will do first is once it has killed something, it'll eat that neck and head. So that's that there's a lot of death in this sport they say and uh, that if you uh, if you can imagine what it'd be like to lose your hunting dog by coyotes when you're hunting I mean that's the same scenario that you face every time you hunt it's not easy but you just have to accept it as your reality can you tell us a little bit about the training process that you put a bird through yep training process is pretty complicated <clears throat> I like uh, birds that have been raised by their parents this is a chamber raised bird and what it is, um, well, to give you a little background, 
when the peregrine falcon was extirpated on the east coast due to DDT, um, it was North American falconers had peregrine falcons in their possession. And then they became very successful at breeding peregrine falcons and use an old falconry uh, practice which is called hacking. And uh, to hack a bird is to put a bird out at a hack site, either on a cliff site or on a platform or even on some buildings um, when it's young to get it used to so it matures physiologically and psychologically similar to what it would if it was raised by a wild parent. And then ultimately those adults came back and started nesting at those hack sites and uh, you know, and now we have more peregrine falcons than there were documented before DDT back in the 60s. Uh, but anyway, due to that process, uh, North American falconers have become very proficient at breeding birds of prey. She is a pure peels peregrine falcon, and uh, I wanted a pure peels, so I uh, ordered one from a friend of mine out in Spokane, Washington, to get a pure peels. But as soon as you get a bird, the first process is the manning process. And what that manning process is, is taming the bird down so it is going to be able to tolerate you in close proximity. And how you do that is you start to lower the bird's weight and you positively reinforce the time you spend together with food. Just like when the hood came off, she had her food. Um, that's essentially what you do to start out with. After that, uh, you continue to lower her weight and you'll not only teach her that there's food on the glove, but also that you take a lure, which is uh, basically a, uh, a leather pouch which is garnished with meat, and throw that out to her and get her what's called wedded to the lure. So that way you have a way to retrieve her in the field. So basically you're feeding her on the fist or on the lure every day. Um, where I want a falcon to take a position above me in the field to go hunting, what I do is I get the bird flying to that food reward and then I suspend that on a kite or a balloon string. And I train in a field up in Richmond and I'll run that garnished reward on that kite string up to a thousand feet. So they'll go and uh, then they're positively reinforced. They have to fly, work hard, fly up to a high position to get that food reward. Once I've got them flying up to that food reward on the kite string, then I start introducing them to bag quarry. Uh, so they realize they go up, then uh, a domestic mallard comes out of a bird launcher, then they get to chase something. So then they realize if they go up and get in position, something's gonna get flushed for them to chase. So in very simple terms, that's the process, um, but ultimately it can be a lot more complicated. You need to identify and, and circumvent any issues with the bird or solve problems where the bird's not catching on to the process and things like that. But in a nutshell, that's kind of how it goes. Uh, but first thing you need to do is build a relationship of trust. So how do you get them to come back to you? Uh, they're hungry. I weigh them every day and I know what their weight is and then I monitor that weight range and see how they react so whenever they're flown they're motivated to either come back to me for their daily food or to harvest a duck and the only time they're flown their feeding cycle is with their hunting cycle so every day when they're hungry that's when we go fly ducks so it's all it's all monitored and... Uh, Why don't they just take the duck and go off? Because they can't do that. The duck outweighs her two to one. All she can do... All she can do is take the duck to the ground and then I make in as quick as I can to dispatch the duck. And even when she grabs the duck on the ground isn't a guarantee that she's gonna keep the duck. You know, the duck is strong, the duck can get right up and walk and if the duck can get back into the water, it's going to be back safe again. So. Do they have any motivation other than food? Do they, do, like a dog, do they want to please their master or anything? Not at all. No. There is no social dynamic with a bird of prey. Men have been practicing falconry for over 4,000 years. Mm -hmm. Falcons have never been domesticated. They never will be domesticated. The only association she has, the only 
with me is I'm a guaranteed meal. She could care less what happened to me. That said, do you, you find any personality differences from one falcon? Oh, absolutely. They're like dogs or people or anything else. They're all different. And that's what I was saying about kind of adjusting your training regime to accommodate differences in birds of prey. Mm -hmm. Some will pick it up right away. Some you'll kind of plateau. It's like, you know, this is, why can't she make the next step, you know? And how do, what do I do to get her through this plateau and continue the training? The biggest thing to do, it's, it's fairly fundamental, simple fundamental steps to follow to ultimately get to the, your final goal of having a good hunting companion. Uh, but you're, what you really want to do is make sure you don't make mistakes. Uh, early on, I don't remember exactly what it was, but uh, <clears throat> she has a phobia. If someone walked into this room with a uh, refrigerator or a large box on a, on a hand truck, she would totally wig out. And she saw something early on that imprinted on her that that is something to be afraid of. So now if I'm moving wood at the house or something, I have to hood her up so she doesn't see me moving large objects around so she doesn't get all upset and afraid. So, I mean, it's those kind of things you have to look out for. You have to make sure every time she's introduced to dogs or people or whatever, it's done without any fear or in a very as low fear and scenario that you can possibly create for her. Because otherwise, you could have, uh, you know, this imprinted, un realistic fear that will always be there. So, I mean, handling her, hooding her, and doing everything I do. Basically, this bird demands a lot of personal space. There's no touchy-feely in falcons. Some you can handle more than others. This one, she doesn't like to be touched or handled. But I need to be able to hood her. I need to be able to uh, slip these jesses in and out, change them over to hunting jesses, and just have her get used to the normal handling of every day. And that's all I really want to have to be able to do with her, um, just to make my life easier to be able to go and hunt without a lot of issues. But um, no, there's, there's no relationship at all. And uh, she does not tolerate <coughs> being touched. If I reached in there, she'd grab me with her feet. And uh, what's interesting about falcon's feet, um, they've evolved such that the tendons run through ribbed sheaths. And uh, so when she locks down on something, it just locks down. And uh, then she doesn't even have to put any energy into holding on to something. And the more you resist, the more she'll lock down. So the best thing to do is not to get grabbed in the first place. But once you do, you just wait for her to let go. Because, uh, you know, all in due time. But she's gotten a lot better, you know, and they, uh, you know, she's, even though she's not an imprint bird, she doesn't think of a mate. She acts to some degree like, uh, like I'm her partner. And I have to believe it's because I've been feeding her for the last three years. So she kind of, and in the wild, a, a wild male, which is called a tiercel. And that's from the French word tiercy, uh, which means one third. That's a beetle, big stretch. Um, you know, the, the tiercel in the wild uh, wins over the female by bringing her food. So I think uh, she'll actually, uh, you know, what she does, she'll eat up at me and she'll bow to me. When I come out to pick her up on the block, she'll bow and she'll eat up and that's what she would normally do to a mate. So in some respects, she kind of sees me as a mate, but uh, not really. I mean, not... Uh, if she were to breed, she uh, would be chambered up with a tear soul and hopefully they'd like each other and ultimately breed naturally. Yes, ma'am. Is there a particular hunting season and regulation as by the Department of Wildlife? Falconry is the most heavily regulated field sport there is. And that is primarily because this bird is protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And just like I said earlier, this bird, there's no personal ownership of birds. Um, this bird belongs as much to you or, you know, that's the model that the United the U.S. Fish and Wildlife works on. So, yes, first of all, to be a falconer in Maine, you need to have a hunting license and hopefully a strong hunting background, regular firearm or bow hunting license. So you need to go to 
hunter safety classes just like everyone else does. Then to become a falconer, you actually need to uh, go through an apprenticeship program. And uh, what that is, uh, for, t for a minimum of two years, you are an apprentice falconer. You have to find a, either a master class or a general class falconer who is willing to take you on as their apprentice. Uh, you need to uh, build facilities, both indoor and outdoor facilities, which have to be uh, inspected by a state biologist. You have to pass a 100-question test. And once you've gone through all of that, then you can send in for your state license. You're protecting those wild birds by making sure you're the appropriate... Well, yeah, there's a, okay. you know, there's a baseline that you have to show that, a base level of competence that you have to show before you're allowed to take a bird from the wild. And then as an apprentice falconer, you're only allowed to use either a red-tailed hawk or a kestrel. Uh, in Maine, the red tail is really the most practical choice. Then you need to go trap your own red tail. You need to train it. You need to enter it on game. And in Maine, to move on to a general class falconer, you have to take at least 10 head of game in one season before you are allowed to move on to that next step. So you have to show a level of proficiency. You know, in other states, you just are a licensed apprentice for two years, not even necessarily trap a hawk. At the end of the two years, you automatically have the right to, uh, you know, become a general class falconer. In Maine, it's thought that uh, we want to keep maintain a high level of competency in the sport, the art of falconry. So that's why we so kind of self-regulate what we do. Uh, the feds still have jurisdiction over birds of prey and falconry ultimately. But uh, they've just, like so many other things, they've shifted all the responsibility to the states. So the Maine Falconry and Raptor Conservancy, the group of falconers practicing in Maine, sat down with IFNW, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, and we totally rewrote the regulations from a, a model that the feds gave, that this is what the feds are going to allow. If you want to make it more restrictive, you can, but you can't make it any less restrictive. So we took that model, we wrote it to what we felt was the best set of regulations for Maine, uh, made it far more restrictive than what the feds, the, the outline the feds gave us. We also rewrote uh, two new 100-question tests to bring them more in into the times. I mean, the tests had been written back in the 80s, and now there are a lot of advances in falconry, like telemetry and different things, and medicine uh, that, you know, an average apprentice should know. So we've gone through that whole process, and, uh, and, also, uh, and also have gotten uh, a wild peregrine take, which is something that has not been possible since, uh, I think, 1972. And uh, this is the third year of uh, Maine Falconers to be able to take a wild peregrine, and I'm happy to say I was lucky enough to be one of the lucky two in the lottery this year and trapped a wild peregrine on uh, the first of the month. Mm -hmm. How many birds so my do you third have? question is, I wonder why the male is named after the word third in French, which doesn't Tiercy. mean the ordinal third, it means a third, like the a fraction. Well, he one third smaller than the female. If you had a tiercel here, you'd be obvious which was the male and which is the female. And there's a range there. You can have small females, uh, large males, small males. I mean, you could have a small... If you looked at my friend's tundra tiercel next to this large peels, uh, they would look like two different species. Because he flies at around 500 grams, and she's, uh, she's around 1,000 grams. So she's twice as big. But... You know, she's a peels, which is the largest subspecies of peregrine in the world. He's a tundra, which is kind of in the middle. Uh, so there's a huge variance, you know, in size. So species of variety, the male is always going to be... Always, well, that's typically true in all birds of prey. Interesting. I mean, eagles. I mean, you is see a mondo... Is it flight and hunting, or what, was it for... Um, ideally, or? when... Uh, well, the, the, the theory is this. Uh, the female stays with the eggs. Uh, so a larger bird is going to be able to better protect the bird from um, mammalian predators. Um, and the male goes out and does all the hunting while the female stays on. Uh, eventually, it gets to a point where, you know, it's very difficult. Once the chicks get big enough and they have ravenous appetites, it's tough for the male to keep up. So then at that point, the female will start hunting as well. And she's bigger and hopefully able to take larger prey species 
to be able to time that to properly feed and raise, you know, their iases. That's the theory. Uh, it makes sense to me. Um, but why is it one third difference? I don't know. It can be uh, it can be a danger for the male of some species because I've known of people putting birds together in hopes that they would breed and ultimately it ended up just in the male becoming a meal. You know, so you have to be careful. Is there a concern about uh, the, uh, the protected or, or uh, uh, endangered? They're not endangered anymore. They're still threatened. threatened. The main breeding population of peregrine falcons is still protected. Um, are you concerned about mixing subspecies and, and messing up the gene pool? Originally, when the there are three subspecies in North America. There's the peels from the Pacific Northwest, there's the tundra that breeds above the Arctic Circle, and then there's the anatom, or the continental peregrine. And in that anatom subspecies, there's actually a western, Rocky Mountain, and an eastern, which they called the rock peregrine. The rock peregrine was completely extirpated. And when Tom Cade, Professor Emeritus at uh, Cornell University, founded the peregrine fund, uh, there was a debate that we should only reintroduce pure rock peregrines to the Appalachian mountain chain on the east. Well, that wasn't an option. You know, there were no uh, breeding pairs of uh, eastern anatoms. So what they did, and the birds that we have here on the east coast, they're a mix of what North American falconers had in their possession at the time. So there are Cassini subspecies, there are subspecies from South America, uh, everything. And uh, it's true, it's a, it's a mix. But um, now if you look at the wild peregrines around here, they look very similar to uh, anatoms. Um, anatoms have more of a full cap. This is called a malar stripe. Um, the peels has a big, wide malar stripe, but the anatom would have a no white in the back of her neck. It would be pretty much a full black cap around. And if you look a lot of, at a lot of the resident birds, they look a lot like what an autumn would look like. But still, they're, they're a mix of, of whatever we had available. And if they weren't used, there would be no peregrines on the East Coast. And there's a lot of peregrines on the East Coast. I see them all the time. They're easy to see. If you're going back and forth across the Bath Bridge, you can see them up on the old towers of the old Cotton Bridge all the time. Just look up on top of the towers. You can kind of see what her shape is, and uh, it's going to look like a little reverse teardrop shape, and uh, they're, it's pretty easy to see them. I see them in the field because you fly a peregrine, it'll draw in any other peregrine in the area. And it's not unusual for a peregrine to come in and ruin the flight because uh, they'll come in and harass my bird uh, if they're around. And uh, I have three birds. I have this pure peregrine. I have a, the, now the pure tundra peregrine. And I also have a, a jure peregrine hybrid. And uh, <clears throat> once uh, North American falconers got good at breeding, you know, hybrid vigor is something we've known about for a long time. We've used it in dogs and horses and everything. I mean, man has manipulated all the animals he's, he's uh, been in touch with for thousands of years. So the Jura Peregrine Hybrid is a great bird. Uh, it's a powerful, there's such a thing as called hybrid vigor. And, uh, and I do have a big, dark female Jura Peregrine Hybrid that I use to hunt on ducks. I had a Tearsole 50-50, and it was killed in a duck flight out in Nebraska. It killed the duck dead in the stoop but he died in my hands about two minutes later. So that kind of scared me to, uh, to go with the bigger females because, uh, you know, I didn't want that to happen again, but the next juror I got was killed by an eagle. So, I mean, it's, it's part of the game. But it, it's, uh, it's funny. It's, uh, it's, there's some give and take there. What I've found is the ducks are, less, are more intimidated by these larger birds and don't fly as well underneath of them. So I'm really interested to get this uh, tundra peregrine out. She's, uh, she's a little smaller. She's smaller than this bird and I'm interested to see how the ducks react to her where she's smaller, whether she's less intimidating and I get better flights out of the ducks or not. So I mean, I learn something. Every time I go and hunt,
practicing falconry in Maine is, is really interesting. I'm hunting ducks in a tidal environment, so every day I'm chasing the tide. The tide's very dynamic. Um, I hunt around before and after low tide. That's when the ducks are up in the ditches feeding. That's when I have an opportunity to be able to hunt them, force them out over the marsh where she'll have a chance to kill them, whereas over water she would not have any chance at all. Um, and I, you were talking about seasons. Yes, I have to abide by the regular duck season. Um, this year they've introduced a new zone called the coastal zone and that's basically from route one to the coast. Um, and it's a good thing for me because I would hunt the old second season, second, the, there's a, duck season is a split season. As it used to be like the month of October and then it would open up again from the middle of November until around Christmas. Um, <clears throat> the ducks really don't come into my environment until the middle of November so I don't typically hunt before the beginning of the second season. Now with the coastal season that season starts in the middle of November and runs all the way to the beginning of the special falconry season. Now the federal government allows so many days to be able to hunt waterfowl. The gun hunters in the state of Maine only use a portion of those days. So the Maine Falconry and Raptor Conservancy petitioned Inland Fisheries and Wildlife for the remainder of those days to have a special falconry season. So I basically hunt from the middle of November until the end of February. So I'm hunt starting before freeze up, hunting through freeze up, and then through thaw. So my, my you know, my environment is changing all winter long. And it has to do with the, the, what the ducks are feeding on. They're feeding on different things over the course of that time. Um, moon phases, high, you know, astronomically high tides, they all have an effect, overnight low temperature. What the temperature is when the tide's high as opposed to when it's low, whether it's gonna freeze up. So it's a very dynamic system to try to be successful hunting in, but that's what really makes it interesting. When a uh, falcon hits a bird, uh, does it strike it with a talon? Yes. It's, so the talon is open. And Typically, it... yeah. She'll rake that hallux, that back talon across the back of uh, the bird. Um, they have different styles. She, uh, she likes to bind to the duck. She'll just come in. Uh, her style has changed. What I do is I try to get her to go up and then just do the classic dive, hit the duck. Uh, but what she likes to do now is she'll get out of position, let the duck flush, and she'll do more of what like a wild peregrine would do, would just tail, burn it down in a tail chase, come up behind it, and bind to it. And then she'll ride that duck down to the marsh and wait for me to make in. So, but yes, I mean, I've heard that they said that they'd hit it with their fist, but I, I don't believe that one bit. Why would you be armed with these talons to then just ball your fist up? And I've had birds hit ducks so hard that they'll come back, their feet will be bruised. So I would think it would be very problematic to be hitting something at that speed with a balled up fist. Ouch. I had a question. You mentioned that in Nebraska you, you lost your father. So was it the duck that actually... The collision with the duck killed the duck and ultimately the falcon as well. It was the collision. Yep. Yeah, it was a beautiful stoop. He came in from a thousand feet, just a little teardrop. I was really windy blowing out of the northwest and he must have just mistimed that hit. It was obvious the duck just dropped like a brick. Uh, but typically when you'd hit a duck, they'd pitch up and then they'd come back and then bind to the duck on the ground. But instead of pitching up, he just kind of flew straight into this pasture that I was hunting in and I knew right away something was terribly wrong. And when I got to him, he was just, his eyes dilated and he was gone just that fast. So massive internal injuries, I expect. Mistimed that hit. You know, you hit something at 150 miles an hour, mm -hmm. you got to be on the money mm -hmm. or not. So um, peregrine falcons that are, say, in the wild on the bath old bridge, um, so where do they, where's the migratory part? Like, where do they migrate to and... The resident birds, some of the resident birds stay around here. I don't really know. Um, uh, you may know of a company called Biodiversity. They're uh, a company down in uh, scientific guys down in uh, Scarborough. I've done some work with Biodiversity trying to trap peregrines to put transmitters on them to actually see where they go to to learn that. Um, 
But the tundra peregrines, the true wanderers, they migrate from above the Arctic Circle to Central and South America every year and then migrate back to breed. Other peregrines, continental peregrines, and the peels are basically non-migratory. They have no reason to move out of their, out of their area. Um, but, uh, you know, it's different with different species. And the same is true in Europe and Asia. You know, those northern birds are moving down through Arabia and Pakistan and, and all of that, and there's people have been trapping and hunting with hawks for thousands of years over there. Yeah. But uh, I think uh, we put a bunch of transmitters on eagles. We wanted to see where they were going. A lot of them just moved down to the coast. And then some of them are very erratic. I mean, they'll go down to Western Mass and hang out for a month, and then they'll go up to Northern Maine and hang out for a month. They'll go to Nova Scotia. You just, you don't know. That's why I think it's really cool to uh, put transmitters on them and try to learn what you can, uh, because uh, we don't know half of what we think we know, to be honest with you. Very little. How much of your day is dedicated to taking care of these birds? Um, Oh, I don't know, a couple hours probably a day. Uh, I grew up on a farm in Wiscasset, so I know I grew up in a lifestyle where, you know, you're basically tied to your livestock and your responsibility. So in that respect, it's not a big deal for me. Um, but it is a big commitment, you know. And uh, But they say falconers are born, not made. And uh, I can remember uh, the first uh, hawk my father pointed out to me when I was just a little kid. And growing up on the farm, I was always fascinated and chasing hawks around and and stuff like that. And really wanted to be a falconer. And uh, I went to uh, Bryant Pond, <clears throat> the 4-H conservation school, and there was a fellow there, Frank Gramlich. This was in 1972. And uh, he told me, he was from Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, he told me that uh, falconry was not legal and it never would be legal in the state of Maine. Talk about bursting a little boy's bubble. Because it wasn't then or because he wanted to discourage you? It wasn't then, but the irony was it became legal two years later. <laughs> but then puberty struck and I was off in a different direction back in the 70s. So. What's your process for tramping? Uh, well, first of all, you need to learn and understand uh, how to position yourself to be timed right and in a potential route for where the tundras are moving through the state of Maine. Uh, so you need to learn a little bit about that. And then actually my trapping is uh, centuries old Dutch technology, a uh, simple bow net uh, with a pigeon as a lure bird uh, and me in a blind. And uh, you agitate the pigeon so it flops around like it's an injured bird. It's actually on a lure line, attached to a lure line with a little leather vest. So it's actually pretty well protected. And uh, when the falcons fly by, they'll see that pigeon and they'll come in and uh, when they do, you position the pigeon in the middle of the bow net, spring the bow net on the, on the falcon. I had a great day on the first. I trapped five peregrines in one afternoon, mm -hmm. and uh, three adults and two immature birds, and decided to <clears throat> keep one of the immature birds. And, and that was, uh, uh, the law was you could keep the, one bird? Uh, yep, yep. The law is, yeah, you can only, uh, it's actually a lottery, and, uh, and um, in Maine we were given, in Maine we were allowed two, the opportunity to take two birds. Uh, my friend and I <coughs> got, uh, got picked, uh, we both successfully trapped a bird, uh, uh, he trapped his on uh, the 25th of September and I trapped mine just a little bit later on the 1st. You said you're free birds. I do. I have this peregrine, a wild peregrine I just trapped, and a 50-50 jur peregrine hybrid. It's a question of how many you can get per lottery draw. Oh, just so one. Just one. Money. They only allow... You accumulate more than... If I, wanted, if, I could, if I wanted to wait two I years to get back into the lottery again yeah. and trap another one, yes, I could have more. Mm -hmm. But no, the feds only allow 36 birds to be taken east of the Mississippi. <laughs> so those 36 <laughs> birds are divided up between all the states that have <laughs> passed legal peregrine take in their states. Maine was one of the first to do it. We've got a good, we've got, uh, you know, 
just about everybody in a license in Maine is actually practicing falconry. In other words, they're taking birds out and they're harvesting game on a regular basis. And that's what falconry is. It's hunting. Most of Shakespeare, you read Shakespeare and it's all about falconry. The Taming of a Shrew is a treatise on manning a wild falcon. And there's a lot of terminology <laughs> in Shakespeare because that was the heyday, 1620 was the heyday of falconry. It was a part of everyone's life. That's how we harvested game before the advent of gunpowder. Most people don't realize all those hunting dogs were bred to hunt under a falcon before there was gunpowder. So, I mean, the Wiesla was bred specifically to fly with goshawks in Central Europe, you know, hundreds of years ago. So. Is there a restriction on breeding birds? I mean, you, you have to be a licensed breeder. <laughs> oh no, there's no limit on it. There are some pretty good sized breeding operations. Where my 50-50 came from, Brian Sullivan, he's out in Spokane too. I mean, those guys, they breed a lot of, uh, I don't know how many birds he breeds in a year, probably you know, 30 to 50 birds, something like that. Quite a few. How many falconers are there in the state of Maine? Um, I, think, uh, I think there's about 10. 10 or 12, maybe. Yep. Why was it illegal and why is it so tightly controlled? Why was the, why it illegal to take wild peregrines? Because they were on the endangered species list and they were just taken off the endangered species list. But you know, government moves very slowly. I was talking to Ed before the show and I've got a folder of a dozen pages that allow me to be able to go and take and trap a wild peregrine just because that's the burden of government, you know? And those are all the hoops you have to jump through to, to be able to do something like that, which, you know, frankly, falconers, 36 falconers, if they're successful and never have there's, has there been 36, Birds taken in one year? Look. <laughs> We're not hurting the resource at all. You know, thousands of tundra peregrines come down through the United States every year. But it's just bureaucracy. There are too many jobs tied to the protection of peregrines to ever be able to free up the reins and say, yeah, you know, go ahead. And then me, you know, it kind of rubs me the wrong way. If I trap a wild peregrine, she's got a much better chance of surviving until spring than she would in the wild. And uh, typically w what you do with a wild tundra is, uh, is uh, take her hunter and release her in the spring, trap another one in the fall and do it all over again. I don't know if we'll ever have the opportunity to do that or not. So what are the pesticides that are still dangerous? Well, DDT is still available and sold in South America. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was only restricted in the United States. Yeah. So, I mean, there are a lot of problems. We are uh, doing the eagle work with biodiversity. What they did, they did loon work for a long time, and then they kind of wanted to compare it to eagles, another pinnacle predator in the ecosystem, to check heavy metals and all of that. And they are just amazed at how much heavy metal these animals are actually living with day to day. You know, it's just, they would never believe that they could have. So, I mean, there are a lot of threats. Uh, me, personally, um, I don't have a lawn. I don't mow lawns. You know, America's fascination with monoculture and putting the herbicides and pesticides on that that ends up in Mary Meeting Bay. There are a lot of problems in this environment that man is doing every day. And, uh, and I just think, I hope guys like Ed are getting the word out there saying, hey, look, you know, I mean, there is a price to be paid to have the perfectly green monoculture lawn. You know, is it really worth it? You know, and there's uh, that we should be thinking about what we do and how we interact with the environment, um, you know, and making decisions relative to that, being responsible. Uh, so I think there are a lot of threats, um, you know. <laughs> you know, in 1968, there were 50 breeding pairs of eagles. In 2008, there were over 500 breeding pairs of eagles. Now, eagles have acclimated to humans very, very well. A lot of animals do. So I don't think it's so much the pressure we're putting on them relative to our population and expansion, because they're doing just fine. 
I mean, there's an eagle nest right at the intersection of Pleasant Street and the River Road in Brunswick. No one, most people don't know it's there, but it's right in the pine tree behind the cemetery. You know, uh, there's an eagle's nest, thankfully, stopped uh, the bypass in Wiscasset because they're nesting on Davis Island, not 100 yards from Route 1. Drove me crazy though, I mean, there was this group of people ready to throw these eaglets underneath the bus so they could have their bypass. But I mean, that's a good, a good representation of what people are all about, you know? Who cares if it's the national emblem? Who cares if it's a, one of the greatest success stories in, in uh, you know, natural history? If it's getting in the way of a bypass, the hell with them. Do you have a number on the pairs of nesting eagles in the state? It's, they think it's close to 600 now. 600 in the state of Maine? Yeah. Peregrines were 16 documented pairs before DDT. They're up around 25 now. And that's, and I think there's a lot that we don't know about. I mean, there are resident birds right around here. I don't know where they're nesting. I think it's probably just as well that most of us don't know where they're nesting. But they're doing very, very well. Um, but lots of eagles. And eagles didn't really have any help. You know, I mean, they had a little bit of protection as far as their trees were concerned, but outside of that, they weren't, re they aren't really, they weren't really aided in any way. You know, I think sometimes the best way a man can manage nature is to just leave it alone and it'll take care of itself. Well. How does this bird get exercised in the non-hunting season? She doesn't. All of her food resources go to molting and getting a whole new set of feathers. And uh, in reality, you know, when a bird's not hunting in the wild, they're just sitting somewhere. And that's pretty much, she has a weathering yard, uh, which is a eight by eight, uh, 12 by 12 by eight foot high, uh, screened in area, basically to protect her from predators. She has a perch in the middle of it with a bath pan. And uh, she's quite happy just taking a bath, sunning herself, gets all the food she wants to eat. And uh, she's good to go. And now, right now, she's almost done her molt. And I'll start reducing her feather her weight. She's got one more primary to come in. Uh, but I'll start reducing her weight and get her in her kite flying uh, regime, get her in shape, and uh, and hopefully uh, by middle November some birds will show up this year and and we'll be able to go hunt. Can you watch her primary grow? Yep. Yeah, it's coming down. That's it right there. See that? How long can grow a primary? Oh, probably a couple of weeks. But it, she started with, uh, falcons are pretty interesting. And the, the hawks will go primary number 10, which is down the wing, and come right out to uh, number one, where falcons kind of split the difference. They'll start in the middle and start molting feathers, opposing feathers from like 5, 6, then 7, 3, and on and on and on. But with the last one being uh, that primary feather to come in. So it's specific locations, so like a tooth socket. I mean, those, each of those feathers is a specific yep. item, like each of our teeth. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, peregrines are very stiff feathered birds. They're, they're, if you compare it to a jur falcon, jurors are really, the feathers are softer, more pliable. Uh, but I think it's because of the way they hunt. Uh, some friends of mine out in California did some studies and they were jumping out of airplanes at 15,000 feet with a trained peregrine and inducing it to dive and they were videotaping it and taking pictures of it to see its profile at different speeds and uh, what they were looking at is somehow, I'm not sure what terminal velocity is, but a peregrine can dive, you know, well over 350 miles per hour. And that's faster than terminal velocity. And when they're looking at these pictures, they're looking at a little bit of a blur. And what they figured out is these peregrines with their wings folded are actually pumping air through under their wings to accelerate themselves in this dive when they're in full tuck. Faster than free fall. Exactly. They're, they're, they're powering down faster than free fall to catch up with a, with a skydiver who has the lure with supper on it. Send one out with that 23 mile guy that's going to go up. Good luck. Oh, you got to love those Europeans. You know, they're always pushing the envelope. And if he... <laughs> good for him. Good for him. You know, good for him. What's the main food source when they're in the wild? Uh, small to medium-sized birds. 
The, uh, the migrating peregrines are actually fallen passerines, and uh, that's primarily what they eat, you know? So the, the migration is together. You know, they're just, they're just following their prey base. So Do you that, eat rodents or rabbits? Or? Nope, strictly bird, uh, bird predator. Different hawks, hawks eat, I mean like red tails, they're basically, you know, eat rodents and fur. Uh, falcons are primarily bird predators. And also there's a group, probably I hear a lot that, yeah, they had a peregrine at their bird feeder. More than likely it was one of the three exhibitors in Maine. There's the goshawk, the cooper's hawk, and the sharp shinned hawk. Uh, and they're bird predators too, and they're forest hawks. So typically that's what you're gonna see here in Maine because we're a very forested environment. But even so, I mean, it takes a lifetime to really be able to recognize what you're seeing for hawks because of the reverse sexual dimorphism being males. I mean, a, a male Cooper's hawk is about the same size as a female sharp shinned hawk. So you gotta really be able to pick out the subtle differences to be able to specifically identify what you're looking at. <clears throat> the hood is made by a friend of mine out in Billings, Montana, Ray Gilbertson. That in itself is really quite an art. Um, this is what's called a Dutch style hood and it's made out of kangaroo leather. Mm -hmm. And uh, every hood is species and sex specific. So what I did with Ray, I said, Ray, give me, uh, you know, give me uh, a seven and an eight and I'll see which one fits. This, the numbers, the lower the number, the bigger the hood. This seven fits her, the Peel's peregrine, very well, and the eight actually fits the female tundra perfectly. So what you need to do is have several hoods and then make sure the one fits perfectly. And if it fits perfectly, it's basically going to uh, eliminate her sight. It's going to black out the room. It's going to be comfortable uh, and lightweight. She, they're always kind of scratching at it. But uh, this is really a good fitting hood. And uh, is that just a little artist, uh, that's one? called a Turkish knot. That's really there. just, he, he puts a little piece of bone or something in this one. But that's really just for me to be able to manipulate the hood, you know, something to hold on to. And that's really the only reason it's there. Uh, you can just have anything from uh, just a little leather tab to a really ornate feathered plume on top that would look better in a museum than out in the field, frankly, in my opinion. But no, it's truly an art in itself. I don't make a lot of, I, I make the, I braid up the uh, leashes, but a guy down in Florida d braids up the jesses. Uh, there are great things. Telemetry is something I haven't talked about much, um, but that's probably been one of the greatest advancements in falconry is I've just recently put a little tail mount on her and what I do is put a little transmitter in that tail mount and when I fly her I turn that on it's just magnetic on magnetic off and then that way that transmitter is sending out a signal whereas if I get separated from her I can pull the receiver out and find her. If it's mounted to her feet and she takes a duck into the water there you've got a $250 transmitter taking a salt water bath you know so I, and, and, I, and I really want their feet free and clear of anything so they can use their feet. It's like putting ankle weights on uh, and I don't want to restrict her in any way um, in that regard. So that's how, what I use. Actually, it's new to North America. Yeah. Uh, it, came, uh, it came to North America after World War II. A lot of uh, World War II vets saw guys flying peregrines in England uh, and it came to England after the Crusades. Uh, so it's relatively new to Western Europe and even newer to North America. Um, so it's really only 50, 60 years old. And early on, I mean, it really wasn't practiced at a very high level of competency. It was more of a hobby, and they were just learning. Whereas now, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of amazing falconry practiced in the United States right now. Yeah. Well, that's what you do. You saw I knew when she was ready to relieve herself to get her over there. Pretty after a while, you interpret every move they make, and you know what they're thinking, whether they're afraid or they're happy or they're satiated or whatever, or agitated. And, and they do go through different moods. It's like 
when she when she's down on a duck, I'll just dispatch the duck, clip her in, and just let her mellow up because she's totally jacked up, and you want to leave her alone during that period. And then you can see her transition from one mood to another, and you have to be cognizant of that.